This may be one of the more important podcasts we've done. We all know we're living in extraordinarily intense times, the most intense most of us have experienced, at least in our adult lives. The challenge that we're experiencing today are as intense as we've ever seen. And the challenge is not only people are dying, but people are dying alone. Families can't visit with their family members because of understanding of the virus and, and our concerns about how it could spread. And we're living in a world where, quite frankly, we've made decisions that are also affecting not just the people that have already passed away, but also are gonna affect people in the future. And also there are ways we've responded to this virus are having gigantic effects around the world. There are people all over the world that are having all kinds of challenges. 90% of brain surgeries haven't happened. I go through a whole list, but the feeding problem is one of the things I'm most concerned about. And people moving into poverty, which leads to deaths as well. The World Food Organization that the UN sponsors is saying maybe 265 million people might go hungry this year, almost double what normally happens. I wanted today to see if we could go on a um, kind of an exploration, if you will, a journey, not a trip. A trip's predictable. A journey, you might be surprised. And I've been on a journey because I care so much, and I know you do too. Well, what does this mean? I have my own um, parents, they're my mother and father-in-law, but they're in their 70s. I adore them and obviously extreme concern. So I started to immerse myself in every detail I could find on the science of this. And as I did, I came across um, a set of doctors, Nobel Prize winners, uh, professors of epidemiology, some of the most qualified people in the world that were bringing up new facts that we have today that are very different than we made the decisions to shut down the world economy. And science is about, as new facts come forward, make new decisions, but sometimes the momentum of the story and the fear takes us over. I think cases became a big issue for political reasons. Um, unfortunately, there's a huge amount of politics in all of this everywhere. You know, I think that unfortunately, science is difficult and you can't be partisan. And uh, I think that uh, there was a dynamic here and a dynamic which I found very anti-scientific that led to decisions being made. The World Health Organization has a record of exaggerating and I think they do this deliberately because they feel that the public won't pay attention. The total number of excess deaths reported by a website called Euromomo up till today is 160,000, maybe 170,000. Basically, that's about the same number of people who died in an excess way in the flu season of 2017-18. So basically, my guess is it's going to be maybe one and a half times more excess deaths. Excess deaths are very important because if, I, if I'm very sick and then I'm labeled as a corona death, that's fine except I won't die again next month. So basically, if you look at the total deaths, each person is only counted once. Whereas if you assume that everyone who dies of corona is extra, you're overcounting. One of the challenges is that when people were looking at all the numbers that were coming out of the TV and they were doing the death rate, the case fatality rates, they were looking really, and this is a, I'll call it a rookie 101 mistake in epidemiology, and that you don't take the incident rate to figure out case fatality. You look at the prevalence. And it was stunning to me that all the media would put on uh, these so-called experts and, and not raise this issue as to why the case fatality rate is just completely and absolutely overstated. Yes, we, we as citizens need to be responsible and we need to be uh, think about what we do and how it impacts those around us. But we shouldn't be so fearful that we um, decide to live in a bubble and hermetically seal our home in hopes that we never get any more diseases ever again. That's just nonsense. I would submit that we're pivoting towards a time now where we have to ask ourselves our questions about who are we? What is our country? Are we losing personal liberties? If we're going to use contact tracing, what does that look like? Does that look like voluntary use of our phone? Or is it gonna be involuntary? Are there going to be drones that swoop and watch us? We need to be very careful because in the end, when we're all said and done, we're looking at a respiratory virus, a single-stranded RNA virus. We've dealt with these before. And 
We know that 40 to 50% of people who get it may not even know they had it. We know another 40, 50% that get it will skate through it. We know that we're probably going to, at the end of the day, end up somewhere between one out of a thousand patients dying from it. It's interesting because when I was doing the research originally, I remember in late February, I was watching every day because I'm concerned that the death rate shot up 600% in one day. And I'm no epidemiologist. But that didn't make any sense. I'm talking about the world death rate. And then I dug in and finally found a little asterisk that said they changed the diagnostic procedure to no longer having to do a test. This is as late as February. And that that's why the number of deaths shot through the roof, because anything they suspected as COVID, they listed as COVID. And then a few weeks ago, as I know you know, and the CDC made it formal in the U.S. that you don't need to do a test just if you suspect it. But there's actually even, as I understand from you, economic incentives by the hospitals, and some have been reclassified as COVID-19 deaths after the fact. And what is that a financial incentive that you'll share with us? We were basically being advised as physicians as to how to correctly complete a death certificate if COVID-19 was involved directly or perhaps even presumptively or probably or peripherally involved. I was coached and massaged to utilize COVID-19 as a factor in the causation of death, even if I hadn't checked a COVID-19 test, even if I hadn't had an interest in one. And right around that time, Dr. Burks uh, from Washington, D.C. was saying that nobody's going to die with COVID-19. If they have it, they're dying of it. And that was about as silly a thing as I had heard, because if a person gets hit by a bus and over the first two hours of examination in an emergency room, we learn that both of their lungs are collapsed, but also some baseline laboratory works addressed uh, the fact that there was a low hemoglobin, but also a COVID-19 test happened to be positive in the PCR form of it. It would be absolutely ridiculous to put down COVID-19. On the one hand, part of my life is in the trenches practicing primary care. And then I come down to the Capitol where I see this partisan battle for power and And the best way to power sometimes is to keep people frightened and then tell them who to blame. And after you've done enough of that, then sort of step up and raise your hand and say, but follow me, I'll take care of you. That's sort of a typical formula in the world of politics. And I think sometimes when these things happen, we don't recognize them at the time. It's it's when we looked at it through the retrospective scope. So I really think the crisis is pivoting. If you look at the case fatality rate, the number of people who die who get it, It's over 3% when you get to 70 and over. That's a real risk. Yes. If you look at 60 and under, it's less than two-tenths of 1% or about less than twice the flu. But really what you need to do is protect people who are over the age of 70. Protect them from the risk they would have if they were exposed to the virus because they're in that 3 to 5% death rate from from getting the disease. On the other hand, most of the economy is in driven by younger people, 95 to 97%, and they don't need to be protected. We made that mistake early on in looking at the, the data from China, and we will probably come back and regret it, but you could really open up the whole economy and not have much increase in the risk. The problem is without the economy open, we're having more deaths of despair than we are deaths from the COVID virus. Now now what we're seeing is the collateral damage of COVID is way outweighing the disease itself. I can tell you about suicide cases personally, 23 year old. I can tell you about anxiety, depression, alcoholism, all in my community that are skyrocketing now because of COVID. So I think the conversation has to to switch now to how do we get the economy going again? Because the collateral damage uh, of the of the economy shutdown is becoming far worse than the virus itself. We uh, we took a Hippocratic oath to do no harm and to um, to tell the truth. And we looked at our numbers and we had. Uh, some of Stanford's um, uh, preliminary data was out. And we're looking at these different studies and we're saying, well, this, the um, uh, epidemiology of this disease is similar to flu. And have we ever shut down for flu before? We, we haven't. It, does it make sense to shut down the economy, to have folks you know, uh, not have work, not be able to support their families? Um, the inf- influenza is a very dangerous disease. I've had folks in their 30s and 40s die from in- influenza when I used to work in the ER. So as Dr. Erickson, influenza is very serious, but we we are familiar with influenza. So we yeah. say it's just the flu. 
So whenever you have something that you're unfamiliar with, you have lots of fear, and then trying to change people's narrative, their, 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 their mindset with new data is very, very difficult because they have that old mindset. I'm an infectious disease physician, and um, you know, my, you know, my, my sort of understanding of, of uh, and I also do disease modeling, and my understanding is you know, this, you know, a, a disease like this sort of spreads you know, quite widely, and, and, you know, and so the numbers didn't, you know, didn't quite add up. And so that's why we, uh, we put that study together, and, and, um, uh, and, and you know, we, you know, we, we sampled a, a group of uh, well over 3,000 people. We used a test kit that by now has been um, you know, vetted very carefully, and we know exactly what, you know, what it tells us. One thing that I was hoping that our study would do is, is reduce that uncertainty. You know, we were living with such an enormous amount of uncertainty, and I think that uncertainty was really getting, you know, getting people work, worked up. And you know, I, I, like, like many here, I wish, you know, I wish this were not a political issue. I wish this were um, you know, an area where we could come together and say, okay, we need to count all cause deaths because we, you know, the coding is, is not something that is reliable. Uh, uh, you know, we need we need to understand the issue about immunity. We need to understand the issue about uh, you know about the, the age distribution and, and the differences across ages. Um, and these are you know these are some of the very key priorities that will help us really know learn how to deal with that. We have to start putting wrapping our head around uh, and making decisions in a more informed way. The whole purpose of this is to honor those that have already put their lives on the line for us. So many doctors and nurses. Um, I cried just thinking about it. So many police officers, first responders, you know, people driving trucks so that we can still have our livelihood and our life and be with our families that get taken for granted. I know most of you don't take them for granted, but I hope uh, in the midst of this, we don't lose track of all that they've done for us. Please remember, <laughs> we human beings are pretty damn resilient. We've been around 200,000 years. We've experienced every kind of change in the environment, every kind of microbe, every kind of challenge you could imagine. Here we still stand, for better or worse, hopefully for better. And just remember, life, it's meant to be lived. And sometimes we can get overcome by the drama, by what we see and hear every moment, and by dealing with real challenges that we forget that this life is still meant to be lived. So whether it be winter, spring, summer, or fall, whether it be in tough times or good times, I hope you'll find gratitude and joy and love with the people that you love and you'll continue to grow and continue to expand so no matter what happens economically, what happens in the environment, there's a quality of life waiting to be lived and enjoyed by you by just finding things to be grateful for in the midst of challenge. That's, I think, how we stay resilient. That's how we keep moving the ball forward. That's how we serve our children, our family, and our friends. So live fully, live with passion, and hopefully until we meet again, God bless you.